I'm Katie and this is the third episode of Ornamentations which will be a smalls parade but before we get to that an update on the great floss drop trade which I am participating in as some of you may have seen on Brenda and Laura this weekend thank you for the shout out these are mine if you'd like to trade drop me a DM on Instagram my handle is at case track and embroidery I will link to it in the description below I mean is anybody else having as much fun with this as I am because it's really fun and I'm enjoying it so if you'd like to trade I would love to trade but the business of today's episode are smalls or casket toys so in the last episode I gave you a quick primer on Cabinet of Curiosity and Historic Caskets, which for those of you who haven't seen it, casket does not mean coffin. No dead people, nobody gets buried, it's just an old term for a fancy box. These were embroidered by 17th century schoolgirls. And one of the fascinating things about learning about historic caskets are all of the things girls made to put in them because caskets are not plain boxes. They have very fancy interiors. There are hidden drawers, there are sliding panels, there are secret and hidden spaces, and I think it's a human impulse to want to fill them, to want to have treasures and secrets and surprises to discover inside your amazing box full of hidden spaces. And so, really elaborate smalls and less elaborate smalls were often worked by schoolgirls. And this is a historic example from the Burrell collection. It's a thimble holder in the form of a needle lace bird um, that's needle lace over a gilt return and all of those feathers are individually stitched and attached which is a ton of work. And the girl who made this has to have been the envy of her stitching circle because this is just such an enchanting, elaborate little object. How cool would it be to show up at a retreat with that? Really cool, right? But the thing about smalls is that a lot of them over time have been separated from the caskets that they were made for. Most historic caskets that survive today are empty, although they likely didn't start out that way which is what's so fascinating about the second historic example we'll talk about, which is Martha Edlund's casket. I can insert a picture of this because the VA is incredibly protective of their image rights, but I will link to it and I highly suggest that you click through because it's amazing for a couple of reasons. First, the name, Martha Edlund. We know it because most of our casket stitchers were anonymous and their names have been lost to history. Unlike a sampler, it was not standard to stitch or otherwise attach your name to your casket. So most of the names of the girls who made these have been lost over the centuries. But Martha Edlin's name has survived with her box, as has all of the little objects and toys she collected and made to put inside it. And it's a really fascinating, enchanting little collection, and I strongly suggest you click the link and go take a look. Because the casket's amazing, but it's also a really unique artifact in the history of this whole period. And also, try not to weep when you read that Martha Edlin was 11 when she made her casket. I know I looked at that and just felt mortified because I was almost 30 at that point and hadn't yet even put a single stitch in on my own casket and just felt, <laughs> you know, hopelessly inadequate. Martha Edlin making stitchers feel inferior for almost 300 years. Thank you, Martha, for that. But despite that, her casket's fascinating and I hope you'll really enjoy it because I do. And another great resource on casket toys is a series of blog, blog posts that Trisha of Thistlethread did on the subject. I will link to them. They're really great primers. There are lots of pictures. They're a quick and easy read about some of the different styles of toys found in caskets. So to go back on my stitching journey, we are now in 2014 
and I am still the new stitcher. I'm a Cabinet of Curiosity student and I'm still new to all of this and feeling overwhelmed and trying to build confidence, build my skills and find my way so that I can succeed in this extraordinarily ambitious project that I have taken on. And around that point, Amy Minton, who you might know from her book on Montenegrin Stitch, was producing a series of casket keepsakes. Her first set were organized around the theme, The Four Seasons, with two objects for each season. Unfortunately, these are long gone, but she still has a few others on the virtues available on her website. And if you're at all interested, I really recommend her kits. Her instructions are great. They're so detailed and I was a total novice when I started this, but as you can see, I did just fine. And that's a testament to the quality of Amy's instructions as well as to the quality of the project itself. So this is a little needle lace carnation that takes the form of a tiny purse with um, handwoven finger loop braid strings, which you're also taught how to do in the class. And this was my first ever needle lace object. But it's a lot of needle lace. So for each of these, and there are four, two each front and back, you're making a long piece, which you're then gathering at the bottom and ruffling out to make this beautiful flower shape. So by the time I finished this, even though I was a total novice when I started, I was pretty comfortable with basic detached buttonhole stitch and I really have to thank Amy for that because I learned a lot and it proved to be incredibly helpful to me as I matured as a stitcher. Another great thing about her kits, if you are new to surface embroidery or to needle lace especially, is the thread she uses, which is her hand dyed, over dyed silk thread. And it's silk, so it has some shine, but it's really very grippy. It's not as slippery and as smooth as the filament silks I would use if I were doing that project today. And so it's very friendly for a beginner because your thread's not sliding on you. It stays where it's put and you don't have that hassle, which is one of the things you learn to cope with in needle lace as you get more advanced. And then this is the second object from spring, which is another little beautiful needle lace flower, again, with so many petals. I really felt like a pro at needle lace by the time I finished these two. And this is a little, let me unwind it, tape measure, which is so cool. And then you wind it up using the mechanism on the back. And this one again, like the carnation, is her silk floss over a metallic return. These petals are worked separately and then applied in bunches. And it's just the coolest little thing. I loved working both of these, um, especially because I was a novice. The, all the repetitive detached buttonhole stitch really helped me build confidence and it was a great thing for me on my journey. So after that, I started the lid of the Gloriana box that I showed to you last episode and I skipped over the summer keepsakes. But as I was working on Gloriana, she released fall and I bought the kit because I just love these. And this is the first one from fall. This is a little tiny pomegranate. Look at the color variegation on the back, which is just beautiful. And like the carnation, this is a tiny purse that holds a thread winder. And she's got beads and little applied shelves on the front. And it's just this gorgeous, tiny little thing, which I loved. So these are very, these are in the needlework accessory realm of smalls, not purely decorative toys. And then the second up, the second small for fall was at that point I was starting to get a little more confident. Importantly, I was also building a little more stash and 
I was ready to stretch my wings a little bit. So this is the second object from fall as designed by Amy. The colorway is extremely characteristic of the century, 17th century embroidery. A lot of grapes were worked in this style. There were tiny purses and smalls in this form and they usually followed this colorway. So historically accurate, but I had all these fabulous purples in my stash. So these are Alvera Soir filament silks, which are my favorite silks to use these days because of the fabulous shine. I mean, look at these. Aren't they just so incredibly gorgeous? I just was acquiring stash. I really wanted to use it. Purple is not a color I use all the time in my bigger panels. So I jumped at the opportunity to make purple grapes and I just loved it because this is higher relief. The grapes are worked individually over little padded forms and it's just this fascinating, really intriguing little object that fits perfectly inside a casket drawer. This normally lives inside my completed casket and it is a scissors keep. My hands aren't enormous by the way. These are just really tiny scissors to fit the tiny keep. So that's my version of fall and the other way. And then this is Amy's version. They're both beautiful. There's nothing wrong with the kid as design. It's just, I could not resist the siren call of those purples. So now we're going to fast forward a little bit, following the fruit and floral theme to the present day and talk about posies. These fall into the category of purely decorative toys that serve no function. Um, posies have been lover's tokens for as long as there have been flowers and they were very popular casket toys for little girls, I think essentially dreaming of love is why you see so many of them. Or maybe they just really liked flowers because I like flowers too, and so I was very drawn to this technique. It's based off a, a historic example in the Burrell collection, not included in the book I just showed you, and unfortunately I don't know of a photo of this anywhere on the internet that I can show you. If any of the commenters do, please let me know and I will happily include it in the description because it's a really wonderful little object and fascinating. So my version is quite close to the Burrell Collection original, except for the color scheme, which I changed around. Um, the Burrell one is multicolored. I went hard for the pinks to play off the interior of my casket, which has a vibrant pink silk interior. So this is actually my second go at this technique. My first version was an expanded form in the shape of a rectangle with elaborate scrolling stems. It's fairly delicate. I usually don't remove it from my casket, but I also felt like I had more to explore and to learn with this technique. So I tried another one in a more traditional posy form. That is to say a bouquet terminating in a central stem. This is the back. It's all fully wrapped. There is definitely a front and back, but it is finished from every angle. So we've got a big rose here. This is worked in multiple layers of petals. Leaves, a spray of star flowers with little check pearl centers for a sparkle. And then my favorite are these little five petaled flowers with the tasseled centers. These are tassels of untwisted filament silk. So they're just little fluffy pieces of ridiculousness that I love. That's a detail from the Burrell Collection original that really sealed the deal for me when I saw it. I saw those little fluffy centers and I had to try it for myself. So this is my second attempt. We will look at my first when we get to the interior of my completed casket, but we're not quite there yet chronologically. And then this is my most recent posy, although 
not my last. I'm still playing with this technique. I have more ideas and hopefully by the second and third installments of the small braid we'll have some more to look at. Or maybe you're tired of it, but this is something that I have really enjoyed doing. So the pink one, this one, is still very much in the 17th century embroidery context. And what I'm about to show you is styled after an 18th century piece of imperial Russian jewelry that belonged to one of the Tsarinas who ruled in her own right, a daughter of Peter the Great. I'll link to the original in the description because it's a fabulous object. But this is my version with thread and beads. And also a lot of crystals because I really wanted to play up the sparkles because this is meant to mimic jewelry. There's bright check pearl with the crystals in the center of the large flowers and then tiny little check pearl daisies each centered by a two millimeter round for the side sprays which is again a detail from the original that I loved and then a nice big sparkly pear in the center of this one. The bottom flowers are actually real silver thread which I used again because I'm mimicking jewelry and I wanted to play up the metallic and the sparkle factor in this. The other thing I did, which I love, is I mimic, well I attempted to mimic something from the originals. So this was very common in uh, floral jewelry from that era that flower heads were sent, were set and tremblant on springs so that they would move with the wearer as they moved and the flower heads would tremble and sparkle and catch the light. It was a fabulous, amazing effect. And obviously I could not set my flower heads on springs. That's beyond my skill level. But what I did do is I mounted the briolette drops here on wire that was a little too thin. It's thick enough to hold it up. I mean, the piece doesn't fall apart if you give it a little shake, but the drops just lightly tremble and catch the light with the posy, which is my favorite little detail. There are a lot of things I love about this object. I think it's because I love the inspiration piece so much that I love this, but I'm a sucker for sparkles. I can't resist metal thread. I can't resist sparkly crystal beads and I mean to the point of overuse, but I think on this particular project it turned out pretty well. So that's today's small parade, although we will be returning to this in future episodes because I have more. I have a great deal of smalls. So yeah, there will be future installments, but then the last thing I have for you today is my promised blackbird finish. So this is my fabric, Legacy Linen 38 count Brewer's Malt, which is really getting washed out in the light here but it's a gorgeous color that I loved. It is, however, not the called for color that Blackbird used. And so when I pulled some of their called for colors, I was not liking how they interacted with the ground fabric. They were just too warm and they weren't picking up what I loved about the original, I loved how all of these winter elements, the snowflakes and the border came to the fore. I loved the cooler tones that I felt I was seeing in this photograph. And Snow Garden must be a really difficult one to photograph because it looks different in every video and every still that I have seen of it. So it's clearly hard to capture and some of what I felt I was seeing in the photograph may never have been there in the first place, which is why the threads weren't speaking to me in the way that the photograph did. So I made some changes. And a few of these are the called for colors, like this one, which is um, Gentle Arts Toasted Barley. And then the other ones are pretty much 
my substitutions. So as I hope you can see, these are really clustering together. Let me see if I can get them to spread out. These are cooler. These are much, much cooler in tone than the, the browns in particular in this are really warm. And I loved this very cool white, which is a Vera Soie, Soie d'Alger. And then I used um, 103 and Soie Surfine because I just had some great colors in my stash that I loved. So um, color is a topic that I really enjoy and something we'll be talking about frequently in the future because it's a lot of what grounds my embroidery. It drives my ideas forward and it's always a touch point for me when I'm stitching. So we will be talking about color, but if you'd like to talk specifically about conversions, about making your own thread conversion, about altering um, called for colors to better suit aspects of the design that are speaking to you, we can talk about this in detail. Um, I'm not discussing in detail all the changes I made on this episode because as I discovered on my first take, my camera has a time limit that I ran up against. So in an effort not to get cut off again, tabling that for a future date. If you would like a detailed discussion on conversions and how to do your own, please let me know in the comments and we could do that if that's of interest. So this is my finish of Snow Garden. And the colors are really, ironically, washing out. That's a little more accurate. So the white does actually stand out a great deal against the ground fabric when you're looking at this in person. It's not necessarily popping on camera as much as I would like. And then I also, as you might be able to see, accented it in several places with tiny little two millimeter crystal beads, which is another trick I love. Because I will eventually be finishing this as a Christmas ornament, and I can't help adding sparkle to things because it's always picked up by the lights of the tree, and it's just a lovely little detail that I love. Um, I do kind of have to laugh at my own perverseness though because I quite deliberately toned down the design as much as possible in the colorway and then felt the need to spruce it back up again with crystals when really the simpler path probably would have been to just stitch it as it was designed, but I can't help it. I'm a born tinkerer. So I'm going to finish this as a Christmas ornament, much like this one with the beaded border this is just a really simple assembly and if there's interest I could do a tutorial in how I finish this style of ornament because it's really very simple. Anyone could do it. This would be a spectacularly easy finish and I think when I show the finished ornament made out of Snow Garden that you'll like it. Or I hope you'll like it. I'm going to like it. So that's what I have for today. For next episode, we will be talking about an object that's very close to my heart and one that was born out of a mistake, actually. So I'm trying to bring you along on my journey here to chronicle where I started and the mistakes and the uncertainties and the doubts I felt along the way and the problems I ran into because today I'm an advanced stitcher. I'm comfortable with finishing. I'm comfortable with large projects. I have completed a historic casket. I'm on my second one and I've done some things that I'm very proud of and I feel like I've reached a fairly advanced level of stitching. But that wasn't where I started at all. And I feel like if I just showed you everything I was doing today without also telling you about all the problems I experienced along the way, all the struggles with finishing, and most importantly, my own struggles with lack of confidence, the doubts I felt in my own skills and my struggle, to not just develop my skills, which admittedly I needed, I was a novice when I started, but to feel like I could do something. You know, in stitching, there's a difference between 
I don't want to and I can't. And I feel like sometimes we're a little too bound by the idea of I can't, when really you can if you want to, if you want to put in the work to develop your skills and if you can get over your own self-doubts, you can do anything that you want to. If you don't want to, that's completely fine too. Stitching is a space for everybody and we should all always be stitching what we love. And if you are happy doing what you're currently doing, stitching wise, then there's no need to look beyond that. But if you feel like you're being held back by doubt, by lack of confidence in your own skills, I know that because I felt that myself and it's been a very long journey to try and overcome that. And I want to be honest with you in this space and to talk about it because I think I can't be the only person who feels those things and who has struggled with them. If I am, then I'm fine being an outlier weirdo, but I suspect I'm not the only one. So I'm trying to tell you about my journey in the hopes of encouraging you if there are things you want to try but you felt too intimidated by. I know finishing is a big one for a lot of stitchers. We all feel that. I still hate finishing even though I do a lot of it now and do it reasonably well. And I just hope that listening to my struggles and hearing the story of my journey and my growth along the way helps give you confidence in yourself to stitch what you love if you're not currently doing everything that you would like to do. And if you are, more power to you. Everybody should always be stitching what you love. And I hope you're stitching what you love this week. So, the topic of next week's episode is going to be mistakes. How to push past them because I was working my first big casket panel I got about 75% of the way through and then I went, oh crap, this is not going to work. And how I dealt with that, how I rescued what looked like certain failure into an object that today I'm very proud of and incredibly fond of, really one of my favorite pieces, is going to be the story of next week's episode and something that I hope you'll join me for. So I hope you enjoyed today. I hope you enjoyed the small spray because we'll be having a second and probably a third installment in the future. Um, please leave me comments about what you liked. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, hit the alert button if you want to be notified of future videos. So I will see you next time to discuss my big piece that started out as a mistake and until then, happy stitching.